Okay, Anuja Varghese is a Kiwak Pushcart nominated writer based in Hamilton, Ontario. Her work appears in Hobart, the Malahat Review, Humber Literary Review, Plenitude Magazine, and others. She recently collected a, co a collection of short stories and is working on a debut novel. Find her on Twitter or on the web, and I'll put the uh, where, where you can find her. And Anuja will be reading from her short story, Stories in the Language of the Fist. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to see you all. Um, I'm so excited to be here and so thankful to the editors at the Fiddlehead and the editors of this issue for, for creating this space. Um, so yeah, I'm going to read from this piece, uh, Stories in the Language of the Fist. Uh, I wrote this in a, in a wee little fit of rage one day. <laughs> um, fun fact, uh, all the microaggressions you may pick up throughout this are true uh, to me or to my friends or colleagues. Um, and I'm thankful to have this space to share them. Uh, Stories in the Language of the Fist. 1999. It was a standoff on wheels. Jessica number one and number two on their bikes, Melissa on rollerblades, and Farah shifting her weight nervously on the skateboard beneath her. So like, where are you from? Jessica number two asked. Uh, Montreal, Farah replied, even though Mr. Ryan had already mentioned that in his introduction of her to the class earlier that day. I mean, I was born in Vancouver, but I'm from Montreal. Melissa pulled her hair free of its elastic and made easy figure eights around the other three. No, like, where are you actually from? Farrah froze, not fully understanding the question. It was only as they stared at her expectantly with their blue eyes and their freckled noses and their tan lines sharply drawn from summers spent roasting on the docks at each other's cottages that Farrah began to see herself as they saw her. I guess my parents moved here from India, she said, but like a long time ago. The Jessicas smirked at one another. Told you, number one said to number two, before giving Farah a once over that served as both insult and inside joke at once. It was a hostility for which Farah had no name, not yet. We gotta go, Jessica number one said, smacking her gum, see you around. Trailing the Jessicas and skating backwards with the elastic around her wrist, Melissa looked at Farah with something akin to pity. She told us she knew something smelled like curry, Melissa said with a, with a slight shrug that conveyed apology and apathy in equal measure. She tightened the hoodie around her waist and turned to catch up with the others so that they made again an Abercrombie and Gap clad trio sailing together along the midtown sidewalks on a Monday afternoon. Farah was halfway around Deer Park, her house just across the street before she realized what they had meant, that she smelled like curry, it was her. She left her board on the front porch, sniffed the sleeve of her sweatshirt, then inhaled the air in the foyer as she kicked off her shoes. Her clothes smelled like CK1, the closet smelled like leather and wool, and the hallway smelled like the lilies from the arrangement on the dining room table. Lasagna for dinner, Farah, mom called from the kitchen, or daddy can do tuna steaks on the BBQ. Whatever, Farah yelled as she ran up the stairs. She locked the bathroom door and shed her clothes, then stood under a too hot shower scrubbing at her skin with a soapy sea green loofah. That was the day the fist unfurled from Farah's ribs and fastened itself around a lung, not so that she couldn't breathe, but just so that she would always be aware of breathing, of the way things smelled, so that she would always keep air freshener, deodorant and perfume in her purse, just in case, just in case it was always her. 2009. Farah met David at a garden party for donors to the University of Toronto School of Medicine. Mum said it was important that they all be there to support daddy and to say thank you to the people who gave him the money to continue his research. What she didn't say, but what Farah came to understand was that it was just as important to be seen at these events, to sip champagne under the white tent in the Hart House garden, to smile and introduce herself and to say, yes, I'm very much enjoying the MBA program here. It's obviously number one in the country for a reason. A couple Farah recognized from all the donor events paused on their way out to make chit chat, the woman's soft pale hand on her bare shoulder startling her out of the Mad Men episode she had been watching on mute. 
Darling, look, Dr. Chowdhury's daughter, right? My goodness, aren't you lovely? Isn't she lovely, Tom? You look just like your mother, but I'm sure people tell you that all the time, don't they? Yes, thank you, Ferris said, smiling. No, don't tell me. I know your father has mentioned your name before. It's Farah. Oh, yes, Farah. I just love that. I believe its origin is Farsi. Isn't that right? Um, Farah paused. To say no would be an insult. To say yes would be a lie. I'm not sure. I think my parents just liked Charlie's Angels, so they named me after Farah Fawcett. Both the man and the woman had a good laugh at this, appropriately charmed by the admission. Isn't that wonderful? The woman cooed. Charlie's Angels, the man repeated, looking at Farah as if noticing there was a person standing in front of him for the first time. You know, I find the immigrant experience so fascinating. I wonder what kind of research has been done on the effects of uh, consuming that kind of mainstream culture on immigrant efforts to assimilate. He looked at Farah expectantly and her mind went blank. The fist around her lung that she sometimes forgot was there began to tighten slowly and heat crept in under her skin, nameless and molten, eager to burn. Dad, leave the help alone. They all turned to David's voice, smooth and cool, like spreading salted butter on a wound, a sting and a salve at once. Oh, David, don't be silly, the woman said and gave Farah's arm a squeeze before they let their son usher them along the garden path towards the gates where the valet would bring their car around. Farah went back to Don and Peggy as she waited for the fist to release its grip, but it was slow to let her lungs fill with air again, the fire in her veins not so easily snuffed out. Hey, sorry about them. She had not noticed David's return, nor his outstretched hand offering a flute of champagne. Not the help, Farah told him, taking the glass between long fingers with manicured tips. I know, David replied. He leaned in with a conspiratorial smile. It was a joke. He clinked her glass with his and they drank together, suddenly companions, as if she had been the audience and not the punchline all along. And because he smelled good and looked a little like Ryan Gosling, she smiled back. And when he asked, obligingly typed her name and number into his iPhone contacts, she found herself, Farah, sandwiched between Emily B. and Finkelman. For years afterwards, when David would tell the story of how they met, he would call it love at first sight recounting how she had glowed under the tense white lights, how he had known from that first cheers that they were meant to be. Farrah liked this story, fiction though it was. She repeated it to herself often. She posted it on her Facebook page, texted it to her friends, the same story in different words each time, captioning the cute selfies she took of her and David at weddings, on vacation, at the Santa Claus parade. Facebook Farrah has never been happier, 58 likes. Facebook Farah got a new job, 75 likes. Facebook Farah got engaged, 192 likes. So when her cousin said, aren't you afraid he'll leave you for some gory bitch eventually? Or when David's aunt said, I never believed in mixed race marriage, but I suppose times change. Or when the wedding planner at the Ritz Carlton said, we can accommodate a wide range of ethnic appetizers. They just have to stay out of the ballroom or that smell gets into everything. Farah was ready with concrete evidence to present to the fist. The pictures, posts, comments, and likes became an ongoing marketing campaign for her own life, an endless bargaining for belonging that allowed her to breathe. It would have made Don Draper proud if only he had been real and not a fictional relic frozen in the past. Thanks.